My creepy night in the black pine forest. All right, so let me tell you about this super weird thing that happened to me and my buddy Alex in the black pine forest. I don't know its real name, but that's what we called it. We're both pretty chill about ghost stories and all, but this experience was next level. We hit up the forest for a weekend hike. It's got these massive pine trees and it's usually a peaceful spot but locals sometimes chat about it being kind of spooky. We didn't pay much attention to those stories. Day one was all hiking, setting up camp and the usual stuff. Nothing out of the ordinary. The forest was alive with nature sounds, but when night came, things got super quiet. It was just me, Alex, who knocked out early, and our campfire. I wasn't ready to sleep, so I stepped outside the tent for some air. And then I heard something really strange, like whispers, not the wind or animals, but actual whispering. It was coming from the trees around our camp. I was curious and okay, a bit freaked out, but I had to check it out. I grabbed my flashlight and headed into the trees. The whispers got louder as I got closer. It was like a bunch of people talking all at once, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. It was super eerie. As I moved deeper into the forest, the whispers seemed to surround me. I felt this chill, and not just because it was night. It was like someone or something was watching me. I kept going, thinking maybe I'd find some kids pranking campers or something, but nope, there was nobody there. Then the whispering just stopped, like completely. One second it was there, the next total silence. I stood there, flashlight in hand, feeling my heart racing. I didn't know whether to bolt back to camp or keep looking around. After what felt like ages, I decided to head back. I didn't mention anything to Alex because I didn't want to freak him out, but I barely slept that night, listening for any more whispers, which thankfully didn't come back. The next day we packed up and hiked back. I did a little bit of digging and found out the Black Pine Forest was known for this kind of thing. Stories of unexplained sounds, shadows, and even ghost sightings. I wish I knew that before, but honestly, it probably wouldn't have stopped us. So yeah, that's my creepy story from the woods. No idea what those whispers were, but it's something I'll never forget. During a summer vacation, my friend Hiroshi and I decided to explore the Tower of London. We were particularly interested in St. Thomas's Tower, which housed the medieval king's private chambers. As we wandered through the rooms, admiring the ancient architecture, Hiroshi suddenly grabbed my arm. Look, he exclaimed, pointing toward a window. There stood a woman, dressed in a flowing gown, gazing out at the river. Her long hair cascaded down her back, and she seemed lost in thought. Assuming she was a reenactor, we approached her, hoping to learn more about the tower's history. But as we neared, she vanished into thin air. Stunned, we asked a nearby guard about the woman. He looked puzzled and said that there were no reenactors scheduled that day. Later, we discovered the legend of Isabella a lady-in-waiting who had fallen in love with a common soldier. Their forbidden love was discovered, and the soldier was executed. Heartbroken, Isabella threw herself from St. Thomas's tower into the Thames below. To this day, her spirit is said to haunt the tower, forever gazing out at the river where her love story met its tragic end.
The Forgotten Hour by Darius is Missing. My name is Darius, and last summer, I decided to spend a week alone hiking and camping in the vast woods of Maine. I've always found solace in nature, and this seemed like the perfect escape from the hustle of city life. On the first morning, I awoke to find strange symbols etched into the dirt just outside my tent. They were intricate, unlike any natural markings or animal tracks I had seen before. I brushed it off as a curious anomaly, perhaps the work of a fellow hiker or a local playing tricks. However, each morning, new symbols appeared, each different from the last. They seemed to form a pattern, a language I couldn't decipher. My curiosity turned into unease. I was supposed to be alone out here, miles away from the nearest trail. Determined to uncover the source, I decided to stay up one night. I sat outside my tent, watching the moon travel across the sky, the forest alive with nocturnal sounds. But then something inexplicable happened. As the clock on my watch neared 3 a.m., there was a strange, almost imperceptible shift in the air. And the next thing I knew, it was 4 a.m. An hour had passed in what felt like a breath and I had no memory of that lost time. In front of my tent were fresh symbols, more complex than ever. The realization that something had occurred during that missing hour, right in front of me without any recollection, sent a wave of terror through me. I wasn't just an observer, I was a part of whatever was happening. I packed my gear as the sun rose, cutting my trip short. The thought of spending another night and potentially losing more time was unbearable. As I hurried out of the woods, I couldn't shake off that feeling of being watched. I couldn't get those symbols and the lost hour out of my head. Even now, back in the safety of my home, I often find myself staring at the clock as it nears 3 a.m., half expecting to lose myself in that forgotten hour again. Moving into an old house comes with its own set of challenges. Paint peeling off the walls, uneven floors, you get the idea. But writing appearing on the walls? That was a new one for me. The first time it happened, I was brushing my teeth, staring into the bathroom mirror. I looked away for a second, and when I looked back, there it was, writing on the foggy surface, like someone had traced it with a finger. The word was simple, hello. I wiped the mirror clean, half convinced I had imagined it. But no, there it was in the steam, clear as day. I chalked it up to pranks or my own tired eyes and tried to forget it. But then it happened again. I was cooking dinner and I turned to find a symbol scratched into the wooden floor, some sort of twisted loop. I didn't recognize it, but it looked old, almost like a rune, and it was etched deep into the wood, like it had been there for ages, even though I was sure it hadn't been there a minute ago. After that, the writing became more frequent, popping up in random spots around the house. On the walls of the living room, symbols and letters appeared in faint pencil-like markings. Sometimes it was a word, sometimes just a jumble of characters, but always in that same unknown script. I took photos, sent them to friends, even consulted experts. Nobody could identify the writing. It was like it belonged to a language that didn't exist, or at least one that had been long forgotten. One day, fed up and a little desperate, I decided to write back I stood in front of the mirror, took a deep breath, and wrote, Who are you? in the condensation. Then I waited, staring at my reflection. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, slowly, 
new letters began to form. Home. It hit me then. This wasn't an invasion or a haunting. It was a claim, a stake. Whatever was here considered this place its home, and maybe it had for a lot longer than I'd been around. And in that moment, I didn't feel threatened or scared. I felt like a guest. So now, when I find new writing or symbols, I don't try to erase them or understand them. Instead, I nod, and maybe I even say, I understand, this is your home too. And maybe it's my imagination, but the markings seem less frequent now, less urgent. Like we've both acknowledged each other's presence, and that's enough. In this old house, with its creaky floors and peeling paint, I've found a cohabitant in the unknown. We don't speak the same language, can't see each other's faces, but we share a space bound by walls that hold both of our histories. And in that shared space, we have found a way to say, I'm here, to leave our marks in a world that so easily forgets. The Apparition of Tumbledown Mountain My fascination with the paranormal led me to Tumbledown Mountain, a place shrouded in local legend. Rumors spoke of a woman in white, believed to be the spirit of a bride who tragically lost her life on her wedding day in these very hills. With a mix of skepticism and curiosity, I embarked on a climb to experience the beauty of the mountain and perhaps encounter the unknown. The hike was challenging yet invigorating. As I ascended, the dense forest gave way to rocky outcrops and stunning vistas. It was late afternoon when I reached a particularly scenic overlook. That's when I first saw her. A figure in white, standing at the edge of the cliff, gazing into the horizon. At first glance, I thought she was another hiker, perhaps admiring the view. But something about her appearance was off. Her dress seemed out of place, old-fashioned, like something from another era. As I approached cautiously, the air around me grew inexplicably colder. I called out, asking if she needed help, but she didn't respond. She just stood there, silent and still. It was only when I came closer that the eerie reality of the situation struck me. She was translucent, her form shimmering in the waning sunlight. I stopped in my tracks, my heart racing. She slowly turned to face me and her eyes met mine. They were filled with a deep, unspoken sorrow. In that moment, I felt a wave of sadness wash over me as if her emotions were bleeding into my own consciousness. And then without a word, she vanished into thin air. One moment she was there and the next she was gone, leaving no trace behind. I stood there dumbfounded trying to process what I had just witnessed. The temperature returned to normal, and the forest sound seemed to resume, as if nothing had happened, but the image of the spectral woman lingered in my mind. Later, I learned more about the legend. The story went that a young woman, set to be married on Tumbledown Mountain, had fallen to her death on her wedding day. Her spirit, they said, still roamed these hills, forever mourning her lost love and unfulfilled life. The encounter left me with a profound sense of sadness, a feeling that lingered long after I descended from the mountain. The apparition there, whether a figment of local folklore or a genuine paranormal phenomenon, has haunted me ever since, and I'm not sure when I'll be able to go back. I had always been a skeptic, dismissing ghost stories as mere tales to scare children. But my experience at the Tower of London changed my perspective forever. I was visiting London on a business trip 
and decided to take a day off to explore the tower. The crown jewels, with their dazzling display of diamonds, gold, and precious stones, were at the top of my list. As I stood admiring the imperial state crown, I noticed a shadowy figure reflected in the glass case. I turned around, expecting to see another visitor, but there was no one there. I looked back at the reflection, and the figure was still there, standing right behind me. It was a tall, imposing figure, wearing what looked like ancient armor. I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, and I heard a deep voice whisper in my ear, guard the jewels. I spun around, but there was still no one there. The room was empty, except for me and the priceless treasures. I quickly left the room, my heart racing. Later, I learned about the legend of Sir Walter Raleigh, who was imprisoned in the tower and was said to have become its eternal guardian. Some say he still roams the tower, protecting its treasures. The Ghostly Sentinel of Acadia Acadia National Park, with its rugged coastline and dense forests, has always held a certain allure for me, especially because of the Native American history. Drawn by the park's nocturnal beauty, I embarked on a nighttime exploration, a decision that led me to an encounter both awe-inspiring and unsettling. The night was clear, full of stars illuminating the sky. The park was serene, its usual daytime bustle replaced by the quiet sounds of nature. As I walked along the coastal path, the sound of waves crashing against the cliffs was like a soothing backdrop. It was when I reached a particularly secluded cove that I first sensed something odd. A chill ran through the air, distinct from the night's coolness. Standing atop a rocky outcrop was a figure silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was the form of a man, but his presence felt ancient, otherworldly. He was motionless, gazing out over the ocean, as if in eternal vigil. I stood frozen, watching him. His attire was that of a Native American warrior, with traditional clothing and a feathered headdress. I had heard stories from locals about a ghostly sentinel, rumored to be the spirit of a Native American protector of the land but I had always dismissed them as mere folklore. As I watched, the figure turned and locked eyes with me. His gaze was piercing, but I felt no malice, only a profound sense of sadness and a fierce sense of guardianship. In that moment, it was as if he was communicating without words, imparting a message of respect and responsibility for the land he once called home. I don't know how long we stood there, in that silent communion. But suddenly, as if a spell had been broken, he vanished, leaving no trace behind. The night air returned to its usual temperature, and the sound of the waves regained prominence. I left the cove deeply affected by the encounter. In my subsequent research, I learned more about the indigenous peoples of the region and their deep connection to the land. The ghostly sentinel of Acadia whether a figment of the park's storied past or a genuine experience, served as a powerful reminder to me of the history and cultures that predated the national park, a history that demands recognition and respect. I walked away with a deep appreciation for the experience that I had had, and whatever that experience was, I am eternally grateful for it. The Vanishing Hiker of Baxter State Park Baxter State Park, with its rugged terrain and vast wilderness, had always been a favorite hiking destination of mine. The towering Mount Katahdin, the sprawling forests, and the sense of adventure always drew me back. However, my last trip there left me with a memory so unsettling 
It haunts me to this day. It was a crisp morning in early fall when I set out on a solo hike. The trail was challenging, but breathtaking, with colorful autumn leaves blanketing the path. As I trekked deeper into the park, I encountered a fellow hiker. He appeared to be in his 50s with a weathered face and a warm smile. We struck up a conversation and he introduced himself as Tom. Tom was knowledgeable about the park and its history. As we walked, he shared fascinating and haunting stories of the area, tales of unexplained disappearances, ghost sightings, and eerie legends. His stories were captivating, and they really added an air of mystery to an already pretty mysterious wilderness. After a couple of hours, we reached a clearing, and Tom said that he was taking a different path. We bid each other farewell, and I continued on my hike, pondering the tales he told me about. When I got back to the park's visitor center, I mentioned this encounter to a ranger, telling him all the interesting stories that Tom had shared. The ranger looked deeply unsettled upon hearing the name. He told me that a hiker named Tom had indeed been a regular in the park, but several years ago, he had vanished without a trace. His disappearance had been a big deal, sparking all kinds of searches, but no trace of him was ever found. I stood there with my mind racing. The ranger showed me a picture of Tom from a missing person poster back in the day, and it was undoubtedly the man I had met. It sent a chill down my spine. Had I been walking with a ghost? Was it just a coincidence, or had I encountered something paranormal? I left Baxter State Park that day with a deep sense of unease. The peaceful, familiar trails now seemed shrouded in something darker. The encounter with the vanished hiker, the very man who had disappeared in those woods years ago, left me questioning pretty much everything I knew. I had always been an avid photographer and the Tower of London was a gold mine for capturing the essence of England's history. One day, I decided to focus on the Beecham Tower, known for its graffiti carved by prisoners. As I set up my equipment, the atmosphere grew heavy and the room became eerily silent. I began to hear soft footsteps echoing through the chamber. Thinking it was another visitor, I looked around, but the room was empty. The footsteps grew louder, moving closer to where I stood. I could feel my heart racing as I tried to locate the source. Suddenly, the footsteps stopped right behind me. I turned around, half expecting to see someone, but there was no one there. Later, I learned about Thomas Beecham, the Earl of Warwick, who was imprisoned in the tower that bore his name. Legend has it that he roams the tower restless and seeking justice for his unjust imprisonment. At Haversoft Financial, punctuality was a religion. From trading bell to trading bell, the office was a whirlwind of calls, numbers, and stress, all in pursuit of that next deal. Yet when the market closed, the building took on a different tone, softer, quieter, as if exhaling from the day's relentless grind. But in that silence, I started hearing something else, something I couldn't easily explain. It began as a murmur, a low, indistinct sound just at the edge of my hearing. I'd catch it during late evenings when I was alone, filing away the endless paperwork that came with being a junior analyst. Each time I'd pause, listen, and then dismiss it as the hum of the ventilation or the echo of my own fatigue. The first time I realized it was something else, I was in the office kitchenette, making a cup of tea to power through another long night. The whispering wafted through the air, clearer this time. A subtle, sinuous thread of sound that seemed to come from conference room C, 
the one with the frosted glass walls and a stubborn projector that took ages to warm up. Curiosity getting the better of me, I crept up to the door. The whispering continued, undulating like a distant radio frequency. I pressed my ear against the cold surface, straining to make out words, but caught only disjointed symbols, fragments of sentences I couldn't piece together. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the door open. Silence. The room was empty, the projector off, the chairs neatly aligned around the long wooden table. I flipped on the lights, checked the corners, even peered under the table. Nothing. Just the stale aroma of dry erase markers and old coffee. It would have been easy to dismiss it as stress or fatigue. I had plenty of both. But the whispering persisted, appearing like clockwork during my solitary late night stints. It wasn't confined to conference room C. I heard it emanating from unused offices, empty hallways, even the restroom once. I took to wearing headphones, filling my ears with music or podcasts, anything to drown out the sounds. But deep down, I knew it was still there, unseen, unheard, but ever present. Then Yasmin heard it, a no-nonsense senior trader who'd been with Haversoft for over a decade. She was one of the few people I looked up to. We'd stayed late to work on a high-stakes pitch, and around midnight she'd gone to make a phone call. When she came back, her face was ashen, her lips pressed into a tight line. Did you hear that? She asked, her voice tinged with disbelief. Hear what? I knew, of course, what she was talking about, but acknowledging it felt like crossing a line from which there'd be no turning back. The whispering in Roger's office. Roger, one of our VPs, was out of town. I hesitated, then nodded. Yeah, I've heard it before. No idea what it is. Yasmin shook her head, as if trying to dispel the very notion. This place, I swear. Too many long hours, not enough sleep. We never spoke of it again, but the atmosphere had shifted. An unspoken tension had settled, a shared secret neither of us wanted to probe. Weeks passed, and the whispering grew bolder. Now, I didn't just hear it in empty rooms. It seemed to emanate from the walls themselves. It was as if the building had taken on a life of its own, whispering secrets it had gleaned from years of high-stakes deals, broken promises, and corporate maneuverings. The final straw was the night before the quarterly review. The office was deserted, everyone having left to get some rest before the grueling day ahead. I was putting the finishing touches on a presentation when I heard it. Clear, distinct, almost intimate. The whispering filled my office, emanating from the walls, the ceiling, even the floor. It spoke in fragments, disjointed phrases that made no sense. The numbers lie, under the surface, see but don't tell. Each one layered over the other in a cacophony of insinuation. My heart pounded, my breath came in short, sharp gasps. This couldn't be stress or fatigue. It was too real, too immediate. I bolted from my office, slamming the door behind me. The whispering stopped as suddenly as it had started. The building was silent once more, its secrets contained within its walls. I still work at Haversoft Financial. The whispering has faded, but it's not gone. Sometimes, when the office is quiet and the weight of my workload lightens for a moment, I hear it. A soft, almost mocking murmur that seems to beckon from within the walls. I've learned to ignore it, to go about my business as if it's just another quirk of the building. But every now and then, when I'm alone, when the office is shrouded in the stillness of the night, I wonder, what secrets is it hiding? What truths are etched into its very foundation? And most disturbingly, what will happen when the whispers grow loud enough to be heard?
One evening, my sister Priya and I decided to stay late at the Tower of London to catch the sunset over the Thames. As the golden hues faded, we found ourselves near the Lanthorn Tower. Known for its medieval library, it was a quieter part of the complex. As we approached, a soft melody reached our ears. It sounded like someone playing a lute, the notes melancholic and haunting. Intrigued, we followed the sound, hoping to find a musician or perhaps a recording. But as we entered the tower, the music stopped abruptly. The room was empty, save for the ancient manuscripts and books. We searched for speakers or any source of the music, but found nothing. On our way out, a guard overheard our conversation about the mysterious melody. He nodded and shared the tale of Sir Geoffrey, a scholar imprisoned in the Lanthorn Tower for his controversial writings. Sir Geoffrey, a talented lute player, would play his instrument to pass the time and find solace. It's said that on quiet evenings, the melancholic tunes of Sir Geoffrey can still be heard, a testament to his indomitable spirit and love for music. The Hidden Grove by Kara L. This last autumn, I embarked on a solo hike through the woods of the Hartz Mountains, a region in Germany steeped in lore and mystery. My plan was to follow a well-trodden path to the Brocken, the highest peak, known for its panoramic views and eerie history. As the sun began to dip, casting long shadows through the trees, I realized I had strayed off the marked trail. The dense canopy overhead muffled the sounds of the forest, leaving a heavy silence. I checked my map, trying to regain my bearings, when a soft whisper reached my ears. It was a gentle, coaxing voice, barely audible over the rustling leaves. It seemed to tell me to follow it. Looking around, I saw no one. I felt a shiver run down my spine, but rationalized it was just the wind making sounds that seemed like a voice. However, the whispers persisted, growing slightly louder, guiding me deeper into the woods. Despite my better judgment, curiosity led me forward. I wandered through the dense thicket, the whispers growing clearer with each step. The trees around me seemed ancient, their gnarled branches intertwining like silent guardians of some kind of forgotten realm. The air grew cooler, and a faint mist began to rise from the forest floor. Then, I stumbled into a clearing. It was a hidden grove, encircled by towering trees. Their trunks were covered in strange symbols that looked centuries old. In the center of the grove, a stone altar stood, worn by time. The whispers ceased abruptly, replaced by an overwhelming silence. I approached the altar, my heart pounding. On it lay a small, intricately carved wooden figure, its features weathered by age. The moment I touched it, a cold gust of wind swept through the grove, causing the trees to sway and groan. The whispers returned, now a chorus of indistinct voices, as if the trees themselves were speaking. Fear gripped me. I knew I had to leave. I turned to retrace my steps, but the path I had come through was gone, replaced by an impenetrable wall of trees. Panic set in as I realized that I was well and truly lost. For what felt like hours, I wandered the whispers following me, sometimes guiding and sometimes seeming to mock me. Just as I thought I was about to be lost forever, a familiar sight appeared, a marked trail, the one I had left earlier. I hurried back, not stopping to look back at that grove. Reaching the safety of my car, I glanced back at the forest. The sun had fully set, 
and the woods were swallowed by darkness. The whispers were gone, but the haunting memory of that grove remained, and honestly it still does. I don't know what was there in the depths of the Hearts Mountains, but I don't think I'll be returning to find out. The Vanishing Diner I've always been a skeptic when it comes to anything paranormal or unexplainable. I prefer logic and reason to explain the world around me. But something happened last summer that shook my very understanding of reality. Something I can't dismiss or rationalize away. I still get chills thinking about it. I was on a road trip across the country. Just me and the open road. It was liberating, feeling the wind in my hair and not having a care in the world. One evening, as the sun was setting, I found myself driving through a rural area in Kansas. I hadn't eaten since breakfast, and my stomach was growling loudly. That's when I saw it, a quaint little diner right off the highway, its neon sign buzzing invitingly in the twilight. The place was called Rosie's Diner, and it looked like it was from another era, with its classic 50s architecture and old-fashioned decor. I parked my car and walked in. The bell above the door chimed cheerfully. The interior was cozy with checkered flooring, red vinyl booths, and a jukebox in the corner playing some soft rock and roll. I was greeted by a waitress who I presumed was Rosie. She was an older woman with a warm smile and a friendly demeanor. She led me to a booth and handed me a menu. I ordered a burger and a milkshake, classic diner fare. As I waited for my food, I chatted with Rosie. She told me that she'd been running the diner for decades, ever since her husband passed away. She spoke fondly of the regulars and the sense of community the diner brought. The food was delicious and I was feeling content and relaxed. I paid for my meal, thanked Rosie, and promised to come back if I ever passed through again. She waved goodbye as I left and the bell chimed again. The next day, as I continued my journey, I couldn't stop thinking about Rosie's diner. It was such a charming place, a hidden gem in the middle of nowhere. On a whim, I decided I wanted to write a review for it online to maybe help other travelers find it. But when I searched for Rosie's Diner, nothing came up. No website, no reviews, no mention of it anywhere. I thought maybe I had the name wrong, but I was certain it was Rosie's. I retraced my route on the map, determined to find it again. I drove back the way I came, my eyes peeled for the familiar neon sign but there was nothing. No sign of any diner, no building, nothing but empty fields stretching out on either side of the highway. I stopped at a gas station nearby and asked about Rosie's diner. The attendant looked at me like I was crazy. He said he'd lived in the area his whole life and there had never been a diner around there. Confused and a bit unnerved, I got back in my car and drove off. I kept thinking there must be some mistake some logical explanation. But deep down, I knew what I experienced. I had been to that diner. I had talked to Rosie. I had eaten the food. Yet, it was as if it never existed. It's been months since that trip, and I still can't make sense of what happened. It haunts me, this unexplainable mystery. Was it a glitch in reality, a figment of my imagination, or something else entirely? I don't have any answers, only questions that linger in my mind, echoing like the distant chime of that diner's bell. I had always been a history buff. So when I landed a job as a night guard at the Tower of London, I was ecstatic. 
The tower, with its rich history and tales of imprisonment, torture, and executions, was a dream come true for someone like me. I had heard stories of ghostly apparitions and eerie sounds, but I never believed them. That was until one fateful night. It was a particularly cold evening, and the fog had rolled in, blanketing the tower in a thick, ghostly mist. My rounds took me to the White Tower, one of the oldest parts of the complex. As I walked through the dimly lit hallways, I felt a sudden drop in temperature. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just the old stone walls playing tricks on me. But as I approached one of the old cells, I heard it, a faint whisper. I paused, thinking I had imagined it, but then it came again, clearer this time. Help me, please. I approached the cell cautiously, my flashlight illuminating the empty space. There was no one there. The whispering continued, growing more desperate. Why won't anyone help me? I felt a chill run down my spine. I had heard tales of Anne Boleyn's ghost wandering the tower, but this didn't sound like a woman. It sounded like a young boy. I remembered the story of the two young princes, Edward and Richard, who were imprisoned in the tower and never seen again. Could this be one of them? I tried to communicate. Who are you? The voice responded, its tone filled with sadness. I just want to go home. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to help, but how do you help a spirit? I decided to speak to one of the historians the next day. She told me about an old ritual from West Africa that was believed to help restless spirits find peace. I decided to give it a try. The next night, I brought some white candles and a small bowl of salt water. I placed them in the cell and began to chant the words the historian had given me. The atmosphere in the cell grew heavy, and the temperature dropped even further. The whispering voice returned. Thank you. The next day, the historian approached. Her face pale. She had been reviewing some old documents and found a letter written by one of the princes. It mentioned a secret hiding place in the cell where he had hidden a small toy. With her guidance, I found the toy, a tiny wooden horse. From that day on, the whispering stopped. I like to believe that the young prince's spirit found peace and was finally able to go home. My Experience at Pine Valley Cabin Let me share this freaky experience I had in a cabin up in Pine Valley, Utah. My buddy Jack and I decided to take a weekend trip for some hiking and fishing. Jack's uncle had this old cabin up there, said we could use it any time. The place was pretty rustic, tucked away in the woods, no Wi-Fi, no cell service. <laughs> exactly what we were looking for. So we get there, and the cabin is more off the grid than we expected. It's this old, creaky wooden structure surrounded by these tall pine trees. It had a real creepy vibe, but we shrugged it off, excited for the weekend ahead. The first day was great. Hiking, fishing, the works. But as night fell, things started to get, well, weird. We were sitting by the fire, telling stories and having a few beers, when we heard this strange noise. It was like a soft tapping coming from the side of the cabin. We figured it was probably just an animal or the wind. Later, when we were bunking down, the tapping started again. This time it was followed by what sounded like whispering. It was so faint that I thought I was imagining it. I asked Jack if he had heard it and he just laughed and said I was trying to scare him. I tried to sleep, but the whispering continued, growing louder and then softer. I couldn't make out what was being said. It was like someone was right outside the window. I got up to check, 
half expecting to see somebody peering in, but there was nothing. Just the dark, quiet woods. The next morning we joked about it, blaming the wind or maybe one too many beers. But inside, I think we both felt a bit uneasy. I don't know about you, but I've never had so many beers that I hallucinated. We spent the day outdoors trying to shake off the weirdness of the night before. The second night, though, was worse. Both of us woke up to the sound of footsteps outside. They were heavy, like someone was pacing back and forth on the porch and was fairly irritated. I remember just feeling frozen, listening to those steps, wondering if we should go out and check. We mustered the courage to look outside, but again, nothing. No footprints, no sign of anyone being there. It was dead quiet, and the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. By morning, we had had enough. There was just something about that cabin, something so unsettling that we just couldn't explain. We packed up and left as soon as the sun came up. On the drive back, we talked about it. Jack admitted that his uncle had mentioned some weird stuff happening at the cabin before, but he never took it too seriously. He thought it was just old family tales and nothing more. I've done some camping and hiking in all kinds of places, but I have never experienced anything like that. There's something about that cabin in Pine Valley. Something, as my grandpa would say, that just don't feel right. Gold Coast Encounter by Lena. I've always been a skeptic. Ghost stories and supernatural tales were just that, stories. But my experience on the Gold Coast shook that skepticism to its core. I was vacationing in Surfer's Paradise, drawn by its beautiful beaches and lively atmosphere. I rented a small apartment near the beach, a quaint place that seemed perfect for a relaxing getaway. The first few days were exactly what I expected, sun, surf, and the bustling nightlife. But things changed on the fourth night. I returned to my apartment late after a night out. The place was dark and I was too tired to bother with the lights. So I stumbled into my bed in the dim moonlight. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard a faint whisper. It was so soft that I thought I had imagined it. I brushed it off as the wind or maybe a neighbor, but then it happened again. This time, the whisper was clearer, almost like somebody was in the room with me. I sat up, my heart racing, and scanned the dark room for any sign of an intruder. Nothing. Trying to calm my nerves, I got up to get a glass of water. That's when I saw it a shadowy figure standing in the corner of the room. It was human-shaped, but seemed to be made of darkness, darker than the surrounding shadows. I froze, not sure if I was seeing things or not. The figure didn't move. It just stood there, like it was watching me. I reached for the light switch, my hands trembling. The moment the light flooded the room, the shadow vanished. There was no one there. No way that somebody could have hidden or escaped without me noticing. I didn't sleep much that night, and the next day I asked the landlord if there had been any strange occurrences in the apartment. He seemed uneasy, avoiding my gaze. He mumbled something about previous tenants complaining about weird happenings, but nothing concrete. The following nights were restless. I would wake up to strange noises, whispers, and once, a chillingly cold breeze that seemed to come from nowhere. Each time I turned on the lights, the room was empty, but the feeling of being watched never left. On my last night, things escalated. I woke up to the sensation of somebody pressing down on my chest. I opened my eyes to the horrifying sight of the shadow figure looming over me. Its form was more defined now, almost like a person cloaked in darkness. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I just lay there, frozen in terror. 
Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. I was left gasping for air, my heart pounding out of my chest. I turned on every light in the apartment and stayed up until dawn. I cut my vacation short and left the Gold Coast the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling of that shadowy presence, and even now, back in the safety of my own home. I sometimes catch glimpses of something out of the corner of my eye, or hear a whisper in the quiet of the night. Part of me thinks I'm not rid of that shadow, at least not yet. Shadow of the Giant by Mark L. I had always been an avid backpacker, seeking the solitude and beauty of the wilderness. This particular adventure took me to the remote forests of the Pacific Northwest, a region famous for its vast, unspoiled nature, and, of course, the legendary Bigfoot stories. It was the third day of my trek, and I had set up camp near a small clearing, surrounded by the dense coniferous forest. The evening was calm, with a faint mist settling among the trees as night fell. I was sitting by the fire, enjoying the peacefulness, when a sudden rustling in the bushes startled me. I grabbed my flashlight, shining it toward the source of the noise. My heart raced as I caught sight of a massive, shadowy figure moving just at the edge of the light's reach. It was far larger than any bear or animal that I knew, covered in what appeared to be thick, dark fur. Frozen in place, I watched as the figure moved slowly, its heavy footsteps thudding against the forest floor. It seemed to be observing me, its presence imposing yet not overtly threatening. A part of me wanted to believe that it was just a bear, but the shape, the sheer size of it, it was unlike anything I had ever seen. In a moment of bravery, or perhaps foolishness, I called out to it. The figure stopped, and there was a tense silence. Then, in a low, guttural sound that wasn't quite a growl, but was not human, it responded. The sound echoed through the trees, sending chills down my spine. I stayed still, not daring to move, as the creature slowly retreated into the darkness, the sound of its footsteps gradually fading away. I didn't sleep that night, my mind racing with what I had seen. Was it really Bigfoot, the elusive creature of legend? Or just my imagination, fueled by the tales and isolation of the wilderness? At dawn, I ventured to where I had seen the figure. There, in the soft earth, were large footprints unlike any animal tracks I knew. They were deep and distinct, leading off into the forest. I followed them for a short distance, but soon lost the trail. I left the forest with more questions than answers. The encounter remained with me, a haunting experience that blurred the lines in my mind between reality and what could really exist out there. I don't know if it was really Bigfoot or not, but whatever it was, it was something extraordinary. My cousin, Aisha, and I were on a guided tour of the Tower of London. As we entered the Martin Tower, home to the crown jewels for over 200 years, a strong scent of roses filled the air. It was overpowering and seemed out of place. Our guide noticed our puzzled expressions and shared the tale of Princess Farida, a foreign royal who had visited England centuries ago. She was known for her love of roses and always wore a rose-scented perfume. During her visit, she mysteriously disappeared within the Martin Tower, and her fate remains unknown. To this day, visitors occasionally report the scent of roses in the tower, 
believed to be the lingering presence of Princess Farida, still searching for a way out. The Whistler by Laurel My name is Laurel, and I have always been drawn to the quiet solitude of the forest. One fall morning, I set out to forage for mushrooms in the dense woodland not far from my home. The forest has always been my place of peace, a sanctuary, away from the chaos of everyday life. As I wandered through the trees, my basket slowly filling with chanterelles and morels, I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. Assuming it was another hiker or a forest ranger, I didn't really pay much attention to it at first. But as I continued walking, the footsteps persisted, perfectly matching my pace. When I stopped, they stopped. An uneasy feeling began to settle over me. I called out a hello, but I didn't receive a response. The forest was completely silent, except for those footsteps. I quickened my pace, hoping to distance myself from whoever or whatever was following me. But the footsteps kept up, never getting any closer or farther away, but keeping the same distance all the way. Then I heard the whistle. It was faint at first, like a distant melody carried by the wind. But within moments, it grew louder, as if the source was rapidly approaching me. The tune was unfamiliar, hauntingly beautiful, yet deeply unsettling. I spun around expecting to see someone, but there was no one in sight. The woods were empty, yet the whistling continued. And now it was so close, it felt like it was right beside me. Panic completely took over. I couldn't see anyone, but I could feel the presence. I could hear the whistle in my ear, as if someone was standing right there. In sheer terror, I ran. I sprinted through the forest, the whistling and the footsteps following me every step of the way. Branches scratched at my face and my lungs burned with the cold air, but I didn't stop until I burst out of the tree line and into the open. When I finally reached the safety of my car, I looked back. The whistling had stopped, and the woods seemed as serene as ever. But I knew what had happened. At least, I knew what my experience was, even if I didn't know the source. And I knew that I couldn't go back. I couldn't risk encountering that invisible presence again. And to this day, I never have. Mushroom hunting used to be something that I loved, but now, it's something I used to do. I don't know what it was out there, but I think I'm okay never finding out. The Forgotten Campsite it all started as a weekend camping trip with my two best friends, Alex and Jenna, in the remote woods of Oregon. We had planned this getaway for weeks, aiming for a spot known as the Forgotten Campsite, named so due to its seclusion and the tales that hikers occasionally stumbled upon it by chance. We set out early, our backpacks laden with the essentials, the excitement palpable among us. The hike to the campsite was challenging but beautiful, taking us through dense forests and along a meandering river. By late afternoon, we found it, a small clearing with an old rusted fire ring at its center, the ground flattened by previous campers. We set up our tents and gathered wood for a fire. As night fell, we cooked dinner over the flames, sharing stories and laughter under the starlit sky. Everything was perfect, or so it seemed. Later, as we settled into our tents, a sense of unease crept over me. The forest, lively with sounds during the day, was eerily silent, as if all the nocturnal creatures had suddenly vanished. I tried to sleep, attributing my unease to the new surroundings. 
In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a faint whispering outside my tent. At first, I thought it was Alex or Jenna, but a quick glance showed them both asleep. I listened, heart racing, as the whispering grew louder, a chorus of indistinct voices that seemed to encircle our campsite. I nudged Alex awake and he heard it too. We cautiously unzipped the tent, half expecting to find somebody playing a prank, but the clearing was empty, the whispering voices now fading away into the night. The next morning, we discussed the event. Jenna, a very heavy sleeper, had heard nothing. Alex and I were perplexed, but decided that it might have been the wind or some nocturnal animal. As the day progressed, we tried to put the incident behind us, exploring the nearby woods and river. But the sense of unease lingered, a shadow over our previously cheerful spirits. That night, the whispering returned, more coherent this time. We could almost make out words, but not in any language that we recognized. This time, Jenna heard it too. Terrified, we huddled together in one tent, none of us daring to step outside. The next day, we decided to cut our trip short. As we hurriedly packed our gear, I noticed something strange. Small stone-like objects arranged in a circle around our campsite. They had not been there before. The arrangement was deliberate, almost ritualistic. We left the forgotten campsite with more questions than answers. Who had whispered in the night? What did the stone circle signify? Our search for answers in the following weeks turned up nothing. This camping trip, meant to be an escape from the mundane, which I suppose it was, turned into an ordeal that we still talk about to this very day. Fishing was in my blood. Generations of navigating choppy waters, mending nets, and hauling catches. The sea was both my livelihood and my sanctuary, a realm of endless horizons and hidden depths. But that night, as we sailed under the cover of darkness, the ocean revealed a side I had never seen, nor ever wished to see again. We cast our nets like we had a thousand times before. As they sank, we adjusted our sonar, scanning for schools of fish. But something else caught my eye, an unidentified object hovering near the ocean floor. It was too symmetrical, too stationary to be a school of fish or debris. My gaze shifted between the sonar and the inky sea, curiosity edging into apprehension. A murmur of uncertainty rippled among the crew, our eyes were locked on the depths below when it happened. A surge of luminescence emanated from the object, casting bright beams that sliced through the darkness like celestial spotlights. The ship trembled as if jarred by an invisible hand. Our sonar scrambled, then blinked out. We peered into the water, where the source of the light remained elusive, but its effects were undeniable. Around us, the ocean started to bubble, as if reaching a rolling boil. I touched the surface with my hand. It was unnaturally warm, like bath water. What came next was the most haunting of all. Fish, by the hundreds, floated to the surface, lifeless. Their scales shimmered in the unsettling light, their eyes vacant. The crew was paralyzed, transfixed by the spectacle as if witnessing an arcane ritual for which we were never meant to be the audience. The boiling ceased and the waters grew still. The object, whatever it was, started to ascend, its lights dimming as it moved. With a final pulse, it shot upwards, piercing the water's surface and soaring into the sky at a speed that defied comprehension. We were left in a deafening silence surrounded by the aftermath of unexplained phenomena and inexplicable deaths. I restarted the sonar. It flickered back to life, revealing an empty stretch of seafloor, as if the object had never existed. 
we decided unanimously and without discussion to cut our expedition short. We hauled in our nets, now carrying a grim cargo of dead fish, and set course for home. As we sailed back, the lighthouse guiding us through the dark felt different, as if its beam were now too shallow to reach the places we had glimpsed. That night remains etched in our minds, a haunting intersection between the known and the unknown. We return to fishing because it's what we do, but something has shifted. We cast our nets with a heightened awareness of what lies beneath, of the mysteries that dwell in the ocean's depths. Conversations on the ship have a new undertone, a recognition that the sea, our lifelong companion, harbors secrets beyond our grasp, realms that defy our maps and challenge our dominion. And in the rare moments when our sonar detects something unusual, when an unexplained warmth graces the waters, or a strange light flickers in the distance, we find ourselves glancing skyward, pondering the true expanse of our world and the mysteries that lurk beneath its surface. The Vanishing Camper I've camped in many places, but nothing compares to the experience I had last summer in the deep woods. It was a secluded forest in the Pacific Northwest, known for its old growth trees and pristine lakes. This trip, which I embarked on alone, left me with an eerie story and a lingering sense of really not knowing what I encountered. I arrived at the woods on a sunny afternoon, found a spot near a small lake and set up camp. The first day passed peacefully, filled with hiking and enjoying the solitude. As night fell, I built a fire, cooked a simple meal and relaxed under the stars. That night, I was awoken by the sound of footsteps outside my tent. I assumed it was a deer or some other animal, so I ignored it and tried to get back to sleep. But then I heard a voice, a man's voice, calling out softly, Hello? Is someone there? Curious and a little bit concerned, I got out of my tent. A few yards away stood a man. He looked to be in his forties, dressed in camping gear and a bewildered look on his face. He told me that his name was Tom and that he had gotten lost while hiking. He asked if he could share my fire as his supplies were low. Cautiously, I agreed. We sat by the fire and Tom shared his story. He said he'd been hiking for days, unable to find his way back to any familiar trail. His story struck me as odd. How could someone survive that long being so lost? But I chalked it up to luck and a survival instinct and probably years of experience. The next morning, Tom was gone. His disappearance was as sudden as his arrival. No trace of him remained, not even footprints. It was as though he just vanished into thin air sometime during the night. A little weirded out by this, I decided to hike back to the ranger station. I mentioned Tom and described his appearance and situation. I thought the ranger might be concerned and jot down some notes, but instead he was shocked. He showed me a missing person poster it was Tom, but the poster was old, dated five years ago. Tom had gone missing in these woods and had never been found. Chills ran down my spine as I looked at the poster. The man I had spoken to, the man who had shared my fire, was a missing person, lost to these woods years ago. How could that be? Was it a ghost, a figment of my imagination, some overlap of reality or something else entirely? That encounter with Tom was something I just couldn't explain. And that experience has stayed with me forever.
In the small town of Wiltshire, England, the appearance of crop circles was not an uncommon occurrence. Most locals dismissed them as pranks or natural phenomena. But for teenagers Maya and Rowan, they were a source of endless fascination. One summer evening in 1998, a particularly intricate crop circle appeared in a field on the outskirts of town. The design was unlike any other, with complex geometric patterns and symbols that seemed to tell a story. Maya and Rowan, armed with a camcorder and a sense of adventure, decided to sneak into the field at night and document their findings. The moonlight cast an eerie glow over the flattened crops as the duo made their way to the center of the circle. They began filming, capturing the intricate details of the design and speculating on its origins. But as they delved deeper into the circle, they began to notice something strange. The air grew colder and a faint whispering sound filled the air. They couldn't make out the words, but the voices seemed to be coming from the ground itself. Rowan, ever the skeptic, dismissed it as the wind or some nearby animals, but Maya was not so sure. She placed the camcorder on the ground, pointing it toward the center of the circle, and hit record. The two sat in silence, listening intently. The whispering grew louder, more distinct. It was a chorus of voices, speaking in a language neither of them recognized. The voices seemed to be conveying a message a warning. Suddenly, the ground beneath them began to vibrate. The whispering grew more frantic, more urgent. Maya and Rowan, overcome with fear, grabbed the camcorder and ran. They didn't stop until they reached the safety of Maya's house. Panting and shaken, they played back the footage. To their astonishment, the camcorder had captured the whispering in crystal clear audio. The voices, though still unintelligible, were unmistakably otherworldly. The duo uploaded the footage to the early internet, where it quickly went viral. UFO enthusiasts and skeptics alike were baffled by the recording. Linguists attempted to decipher the language, but it didn't match any known to man. The crop circle was soon cordoned off by local authorities, and a team of scientists was brought in to investigate. But no explanation of the phenomenon was ever found. Maya and Rowan's footage became the subject of countless documentaries and investigations. The crop circle whispers, as they became known, were hailed as some of the most compelling evidence of extraterrestrial contact. The two teenagers became overnight celebrities, but they remained grounded, always emphasizing the importance of seeking the truth and keeping an open mind. The crop circle eventually faded, and the field returned to its natural state. But the mystery of that summer night in Wiltshire remained, a testament to the unknown wonders of the universe. A webcam isn't the most sophisticated piece of technology for capturing celestial phenomena, but sometimes low-tech is all you have. It was my only option for monitoring the sky while working a tedious security job at a remote power plant. Mostly, the webcam caught passing clouds, birds, or the occasional plane. Not groundbreaking stuff, but it broke the monotony. But one night, something was off. I felt it before I saw it, like static in the air, a heightened sense of tension I couldn't shake. It prickled the back of my neck as I stared at the computer screen, the live feed displaying an inky sky punctuated by stars. And then they appeared, objects, fast, erratic, and too numerous to count, darting across the sky. Blink and you'd miss them, but once you noticed you couldn't unsee them. They were dubbed fast walkers in the amateur astronomy community, but these were faster and smaller than any description I had ever read. My breath caught as I immediately hit the button to record the feed. The fast walkers continued their chaotic dance, spiraling, zigzagging, 
defying the laws of physics and aerodynamics. Too fast for birds, too erratic for any known aircraft. As I squinted into the screen, they seemed to pulse, as if emitting some sort of energy or light. When it was over, the sky returned to its dormant state, an empty stage after the performers had taken their final bow. I sat there, pulse still racing, cursor hovering over the saved file. Could it be a glitch? A camera malfunction? Deep down, I knew it wasn't. The footage was transferred onto a thumb drive, then uploaded into every cloud account I owned. It needed to be shared, analyzed, scrutinized. There was something that shattered the status quo, a glitch in the matrix of our everyday reality. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I replayed the footage over and over, each viewing deepening my sense of awe and dread. This was beyond me, beyond any conventional explanation. I needed to know more. Expert opinions varied, from dismissive scorn to hushed incredulity. Frame by frame, analysis showed no editing, no tampering. The fast walkers remained an enigma, data points that didn't fit into any existing models. And as the footage made its way through forums, YouTube channels, and even into the databases of researchers willing to venture outside the mainstream, I became an unwitting ambassador to a mystery that defied explanation. As weeks turned into months, the chatter faded. More pressing news, more immediate concerns, overshadowed my celestial mystery. Yet my footage remained, stored, archived waiting for the day when it could be slotted into a narrative that made sense. Life resumed its normalcy. The power plant hummed along. My shifts continued in their repetitive cycle, but I wasn't the same. Every night I watched the sky, webcam forever recording, half in anticipation, half in dread of another visit. I became a familiar face in online forums dedicated to the unexplained. My story became one of many, Remarkable, but not unique, in a world brimming with inexplicable phenomena. I found a strange comfort in this community of seekers, each with their own tale, each touched by the same elusive mystery. The sky above me remains a canvas of potential, a window into an unknown realm. But even as the questions linger, unanswered, I can't escape the conviction that what I captured that night wasn't random. It was a brief, frenetic intersection of two realities, ours and something else. Something that flits at the edge of perception, that darts through the gaps in our understanding, as elusive as it is undeniable. As I stare at my screen tonight, the sky empty yet full of stars, I find myself straddling two worlds, the one I live in and the one I glimpse in stolen, breathtaking moments. And as I reach out to adjust the focus on my humble webcam, I can't shake the feeling that somewhere, in a distant, unknown expanse, I'm being watched in return. Reflection I've always been fascinated by antiques, so when I found an old or neatly framed mirror in the attic of the cabin I was renovating in rural Maine, it felt like striking gold. The cabin itself was a fixer-upper, inherited from a distant relative. I had planned to turn it into a cozy retreat. The first time I saw it, the mirror seemed normal, albeit a bit dusty. It was only after I cleaned and hung it in my bedroom that things got strange. That night, as I prepared for bed, I glanced in the mirror and froze. There was a shadowy figure standing behind me. It was so distinct, so unnerving. I whirled around, heart pounding. There was nothing there. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light or my tired mind playing tricks. However, it happened again the next night, and every night after. Each time I looked in the mirror, the shadowy figure was there, 
just standing, its features too blurred to make out. I tried moving the mirror to different spots, but it made no difference. The figure was always there, always just a reflection. It never moved, never made a sound, just stood there, watching me. Sleep became elusive. I started researching the cabin's history. It turned out that the cabin had quite a grim past. It was originally owned by a reclusive man, known for his eccentric behavior. Locals whispered about him practicing strange rituals and dabbling in the occult. His sudden disappearance years ago remained a mystery. The more I learned, the more I became convinced that the figure in the mirror was connected to the cabin's former owner. Maybe it was his spirit or something he had summoned. The thought sent shivers down my spine. One night, driven by a mixture of fear and curiosity, I decided to confront it. I stood before the mirror and addressed the figure directly, asking what it wanted and why it was here. There was no response, just the silent, eerie stare from the shadow. Frustrated and scared, I covered the mirror with a cloth. That's when things escalated. Strange noises filled the cabin at night. Knocks, whispers, things I couldn't explain. It was as if covering the mirror had angered whatever it was tied to. I had had enough. I couldn't live in fear any longer. I took the mirror out into the woods and buried it, hoping that would end whatever connection it had to the cabin. The next few nights were peaceful. The strange occurrences stopped. But the feeling of being watched... That never really went away. I sold the cabin soon after, unable to shake off the experiences I had had there, no longer desiring to turn it into that cozy retreat. It felt like a lie after what I'd been through. Mimicking Cryptid by user TommySticks87 posted to r slash paranormal in a comment. My story is a little boring, but it just happened to me on Wednesday, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are whoever the name of the guy on the ground is, off belay. So, for instance, Tommy, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is always the name of the guy at the top and belay off. So, if Mark is at the top and Tom is at the bottom, Mark will say, Tom, off belay. Tom will then unclip the rope from his belay device so that Mark can get some slack. And the way he indicates to Mark that the slack is there is by saying, Mark, belay off. Obviously, this communication is very, very important. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on a 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time, though. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone's having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor which is what I thought was going on. And then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation, and way farther left off route. It said, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He looked at me like, what the heck was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time. We both determined that we should not be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Well, that ended up being a really good thing because it wasn't him. A few moments later, the rope started moving again. Later, followed by a very faint syllable counted, hey, off belay but my name. That sounded way more like what it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, 
but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that burned in on a route when someone took him off Belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he heard this voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to try to figure out what's going on and then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. Maybe it was nothing, but at the same time, if I had listened to that voice, it could have ended really badly. It's almost like something wanted to cause harm. I had always been fascinated by the Tower of London, especially the Bloody Tower, named for the many gruesome events that took place there. So when my friend Raoul invited me for a private tour after hours, I jumped at the opportunity. As we explored the dimly lit rooms, Raoul shared stories of the many prisoners who had been held there. But it was the tale of Lady Jane Grey that caught my attention. She was a young queen who ruled England for just nine days before being imprisoned and eventually executed in the tower. As Raoul recounted her tragic story, I felt a sudden cold breeze. I looked up and saw a pale figure standing at the top of the stairs. It was a young woman dressed in a white gown, her face etched with sadness. She looked straight at me, her eyes filled with tears. I blinked and she was gone. Raoul saw the shock on my face and asked what had happened. I described the apparition, and he nodded. Many have seen her, he said. She's known to wander the bloody tower, forever mourning her lost throne and her short-lived freedom. That night, I couldn't sleep. The image of the young queen, trapped in her tragic fate, haunted my dreams. The Tower of London, with its centuries of history, had revealed one of its many secrets to me. And for that, I was forever grateful. I had been working as a tour guide at the Tower of London for a few years. I had heard all the ghost stories from Anne Boleyn to the Young Princes, but it was the lesser known tale of the Phantom Archer that truly unnerved me. One evening after the last tour had ended and the sun had set, I decided to take a stroll by Traitor's Gate. This was the infamous entrance where prisoners, often high profile traitors, were brought into the tower by boat. The water lapped gently against the stone and the fog was beginning to roll in from the Thames. As I approached the gate, I heard the distant twang of a bowstring, followed by a soft thud. Startled, I looked around but saw no one. I continued walking, dismissing the noise as a figment of my imagination. But then it happened again. This time, I saw an arrow embedded in the ground just a few feet from me. I looked up, and to my horror, saw the silhouette of an archer on the battlements above. He was dressed in medieval garb, his face obscured by the shadows. He knocked another arrow, aiming directly at me. Panicking, I ducked behind a stone pillar just as the arrow whizzed past, narrowly missing me. I peeked out, trying to locate the archer, but he had vanished. The next day, I spoke to an elderly colleague about the incident. His face looked concerned and ashen as he recounted the legend of the Phantom Archer. Centuries ago, a skilled archer named Arvind had been falsely accused of treason and imprisoned in the tower. Swearing his innocence, he vowed to haunt the tower until his name was cleared. Ever since, on foggy nights, the Phantom Archer is said to appear, practicing his aim and searching for the one who betrayed him.
It was my first visit to the Tower of London, a trip I had planned with my friend Yara. We were both eager to explore the historic site, especially after hearing tales of its haunted past. Our exploration led us to the Salt Tower, known for its inscriptions carved by prisoners. As we entered, a chilling draft greeted us. We began examining the walls, tracing our fingers over the centuries-old carvings. Suddenly, Yara froze. Do you hear that? She whispered. I strained my ears and heard faint cries echoing through the stone walls. The sounds were gut-wrenching, filled with pain and despair. We followed the cries, which grew louder as we descended into the tower's depths. The narrow staircase led us to a dimly lit chamber. In the center stood a large, rusted iron cage. The cries seemed to emanate from the cage. As we approached, the air grew colder, and the cries became more distinct. They sounded like the pleas of countless souls, begging for release. Yara, ever the brave one, reached out to touch the cage. The moment her fingers made contact, the cries ceased, replaced by an oppressive silence. She quickly withdrew her hand, her face pale. We later learned that the cage was used to hold and display the corpses of executed prisoners, a grim warning to all who entered the tower. The haunting cries we heard that day were a chilling reminder of the tower's dark and bloody history. During a winter visit to the Tower of London, my friend Diego and I decided to explore the Wakefield Tower. Known as the place where King Henry VI met his tragic end, the tower had a somber aura. As we walked through the dimly lit rooms, Diego suddenly said, Did you feel that? His face went pale. Feel what? I replied. A cold hand. It just touched my shoulder, he whispered. We quickly left the tower, shaken by the experience. Later, we discovered that many visitors have reported a similar cold touch, believed to be the spirit of King Henry VI reaching out from the afterlife. The Mimic by Julius978 My friends, Mark, Pablo, Tyler, and I had planned this backpacking trip in the Colorado wilderness for months. As experienced campers, we were excited to explore the remote trails and rugged beauty of the area. Little did we know, our adventure would turn into a chilling encounter that we would never forget. The first odd occurrence was with Tyler, he wandered off a short distance to gather firewood, but returned pale and shaken. He claimed that he heard Mark calling him deeper into the woods, but Mark had been with Pablo and me the whole time. We laughed it off, thinking Tyler was just hearing things and scaring himself. The next day, it was Mark who got separated. He had gone to check our trail map by a nearby stream. When he returned, he was visibly disturbed, insisting that he had heard Pablo's voice beckoning him into a dense part of the forest, away from the stream. This was impossible, since Pablo had been fixing his boot at the campsite. And then it happened to Pablo. He had gone to scout a nearby hill for a better view of the landscape. On his return, he was almost hysterical, swearing that he heard me calling out to him from the opposite direction of the campsite. That evening, as we sat around the campfire, we shared all of our experiences. And that's when it kind of dawned on us. There was something in the woods mimicking our voices, trying one by one to lure each of us away from the others. The atmosphere grew tense. The once familiar woods now felt menacing, filled with unseen threats. 
we recalled stories of skinwalkers, creatures of Native American lore known to mimic human voices to isolate and prey on their victims. The thought that one could be stalking us was terrifying. We decided to leave at first light, cutting our trip way short. That night, none of us slept. We kept the fire burning bright, and every rustle in the woods made us jump. The feeling of being watched, of being hunted, was overwhelming. As dawn broke, we quickly packed up our camp and left. With each step away from the campsite, the weight of the forest's gaze seemed to lessen, but the fear was still there. We've been on lots of backpacking trips since, but we've never returned to that particular campsite, and I doubt we ever will. I don't know if it was a skinwalker or something else, but whatever it was, it did not have good intentions for us. Possible Cryptid Near Cook's Forest, Pennsylvania by user Beef Pastry, posted to r slash paranormal in a comment. So here's an experience that I had that I can't really explain. First time posters, so sorry if this story doesn't read well, but this is what happened. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Siegel, Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody at those cabins. There was nobody within a half mile. There's also no street lights or really even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up on Friday, worked all day Saturday and left Sunday. On Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything was pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal for that area. At least most of the times it's pretty quiet at night. So we decided to head in for the night. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke and check to see if the fire had been burned down safely. I'm mid page in my book and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now I'm kind of used to her making this yelp. She does it when she sees a snake or gets a bug in her hair. So I didn't really think anything of it. She comes in limping and says, someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock, not sure of what to think. I'm sitting with my mom while he made laps around the cabin. He fired a couple of warning shots, but never heard anybody run away or any rustling or anything. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now, although I don't know if that's really what it was or not. To be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I don't know who would be lurking in the woods in pitch blackness, fooling around with people. I mean, who would just stand outside in the pitch black with a rock, hoping there was someone on a porch to throw it at? We still don't know what happened. The Message by the Hearth My family's decision to spend our vacation in a quaint old cabin in the Appalachian foothills seemed like the perfect way to disconnect from a crazy world. It was just me, my parents, and my younger brother Lucas. The cabin was rustic and charming, nestled in a secluded spot surrounded by dense woods. Our first evening was spent playing board games and enjoying the warmth of the crackling fireplace. As the clock struck midnight, the room chilled suddenly. 
that's when we saw her, a ghostly figure of a woman standing by the fireplace. She was ethereal, her form barely more than a wisp of smoke, yet unmistakably human. Each night she returned. She never spoke, only stared into the fire with a wistful, sorrowful expression. Her eyes, full of unspoken stories, seemed to plead for something. My parents were really freaked out, but I felt drawn to her. I wanted to know her story, to understand her silent message, to know what kept her by that fire. I began researching the history of the cabin. The local library held dusty records and old newspaper clippings that told a tale of tragedy. A century ago, the cabin was home to a young woman named Abigail. Her lover, a soldier, had left for war and promised to return. Abigail waited years, but he never came back. Heartbroken, she spent her remaining days in the cabin, always hoping for his return. It seemed clear to me that the ghostly woman was Abigail. Each night, I tried to communicate with her, to let her know that her lover wouldn't return and she should move on. But she only gazed into the fire, lost in her own world. On our last night, I tried something different. I sat by the fireplace, speaking gently about the world outside, how time had moved on. I told her it was okay to let go, that her lover's spirit had probably moved on and was likely waiting for her, so she could move on too. As I spoke, a change came over Abigail. She turned to look at me, a faint smile on her lips. For a moment, the room filled with a warm, peaceful light. And then, she faded away, leaving nothing but a feeling of serenity. We left the cabin the next day. I don't know if Abigail found peace or if she simply chose to stop appearing to us. But I like to believe that she moved on, that our presence and understanding helped free her from her century-long wait. The memory of Abigail and her silent, sorrowful watch by the fireplace remains with me, and I think it probably always will. The Shadow at Priest Lake my unsettling encounter during a camping trip in northern Idaho near Priest Lake remains a vivid memory. Priest Lake, with its crystal clear waters and dense forests, is a haven for campers and hikers. I went there with a group of friends for a weekend getaway, unaware of the eerie experience that awaited us. We set up camp in a remote area near the lakeshore. The first day was perfect kayaking, fishing, and exploring the surrounding wilderness. As the sun set, we gathered around the campfire, sharing stories and enjoying the tranquil beauty of the lake. That night, after we had all settled into our tents, I was awakened by a strange noise outside. It sounded like whispers, but disjointed and inconsistent. Thinking it might be one of my friends, I stepped out of the tent. The campfire was out, and the moon cast a pale light over the campsite. The whispers stopped abruptly, and I noticed something moving at the edge of the forest. It was a shadowy figure, just beyond the reach of the moonlight. It seemed to be watching us. I called out, thinking maybe somebody was lost and needed help. But the figure didn't respond. Instead, it slowly retreated into the trees. I woke up a couple of my friends, and we tried to find the figure with our flashlights, but it was gone. We were all a bit spooked, and nobody slept much that night. The next day, we asked around at other campsites, and even talked to a park ranger, but no one else had seen anything unusual. We tried to brush it off, but the encounter had left us feeling uneasy. That night, the whispers returned more coherent this time, as if someone, 
or something, was speaking in a language we couldn't understand. Again, the shadowy figure appeared at the edge of the forest, but this time it was closer. It was tall and thin, and it almost blended into the trees. We all put our flashlight beams on it, but the light seemed to just pass right through, as if the figure was made of smoke. As quickly as it showed up, it vanished, and we were left in stunned silence. We decided to leave in the morning, cutting our trip short. It was just too unsettling to ignore, and none of us could get any sleep anyway. We packed up our gear, still glancing around, a little bit nervous of the tree line. Since that trip, I've heard some stories from other campers I know about strange sightings near Priest Lake, tales of shadowy figures and unexplained whispers in the night. Some say it's just the wind or animals, but others believe it's something a little bit more ominous. Whatever it was, we're never going back. The Night Visitor My camping trip to Starlight Camp, a small, lesser-known site nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, was supposed to be a weekend of relaxation. It turned out to be anything but. I arrived on a Friday afternoon, the campsite quiet with just a few other campers in the distance. I set up my tent in a cozy spot near a stream, looking forward to a weekend of fishing and reading. The first night was pretty peaceful, filled with the sounds of the forest and the gentle flow of the stream. I fell asleep quickly, tired from the drive and the setup. I woke up sometime around midnight, unsure why at first. The fire had died down to glowing embers, and the forest was silent. A bit too silent. And that's when I noticed the silhouette outside of my tent. It looked like a person standing there, motionless. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I called out, asking if they needed help. There was no answer. Against my better judgment, I unzipped the tent slowly, my heart pounding. But as I looked out, the figure was gone. I scanned the area with my flashlight, but there was no sign of anyone. I told myself it was probably just a trick of the shadows, or maybe another camper wandering by and I just thought they were standing there. All the stupid things you tell yourself when you're trying to convince yourself that you didn't see what you just saw. The next day was uneventful, filled with fishing and exploring the nearby trails. I met a few other campers, but none of them seemed to be out late the previous night. That night I stayed up, curious to see if the silhouette would return. The hours ticked by, and just as I was about to give up and go to sleep, I saw it again the same figure standing at the edge of the campsite. This time, I didn't hesitate. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out of the tent. As I approached, the figure seemed to blur and shift, almost like a wisp of smoke caught in a gentle breeze. And then it just dissipated. I stood there, flashlight in hand, trying to make sense of it. There was nothing there. No tracks, no sign of anyone having been there at all. I didn't sleep much that night, my mind racing with questions. Was it a ghost? A trick of the light? My imagination? In the morning, I asked around, but again, none of the other campers had seen anything unusual or been out late. I left Starlight Camp with a mix of relief and curiosity. The experience of the night visitor was something I couldn't easily shake off. I suppose it wasn't threatening, but it was bizarre, an unexplained anomaly in an otherwise normal weekend, but it definitely left me more concerned than relaxed. I've thought about going back, maybe to try to see it again or to get some answers, but every time I think about it, I think better of it.
The Time We Were Chased by Fanatic Hiker 98. My friend Mariana and I decided to go for a day hike while camping in a secluded area known for its breathtaking scenery. The plan was simple. Explore the nearby trails, enjoy the natural beauty, and return to camp before dusk. We were deep into the hike, marveling at the lush greenery and the occasional wildlife sightings, when Mariana noticed something odd in the distance. Squinting, I could barely make out a humanoid figure standing motionless among the trees. It was too far to discern any features, but its presence alone in such a remote place was deeply unsettling. Trying to shake off any uneasy feeling, we continued along our hike, but I couldn't help glancing back. Each time, the figure seemed a little bit closer, still motionless, like a statue observing us. Mariana suggested that it might be another hiker, but something about it just felt off. As we made our way back to camp, a sudden rustling behind us made us turn. The figure was now unmistakably following us, its movements unnatural, almost jerky, like a scene out of a horror movie. Panic set in. We increased our pace, but so did the figure. It was definitely chasing us. Our leisurely hike turned into a frantic run. I could hear the figure's footsteps gaining on us. The sound unnervingly human, yet distorted. Mariana and I dared not look back, our hearts pounding in our chests as we raced through the woods. Finally, the campsite came into view. We burst into the clearing, out of breath and terrified. Turning around, we saw the figure stop at the edge of the forest, just staring. It didn't cross into the campsite, and after a few minutes that felt like an eternity, it slowly retreated back into the woods. We packed up our camp in record time, not even bothering to properly take down the tent. We were silent the whole way home, just processing what had happened, and we've never been back since. The Hike That Never Ended My encounter on the trails of Mount San Antonio in California, also known as Mount Baldy, still sends shivers down my spine. I've always been an avid hiker, seeking out nature's challenges. Mount Baldy, with its rugged beauty and challenging trails, seemed like the perfect weekend escape. But that weekend turned into a surreal, never-ending loop of confusion and fear. I started my hike early in the morning, the sun just beginning to cast its golden hues over the landscape. The trail was clear, and I was well prepared with supplies and a map. I planned to reach the summit and return before dusk. The ascent was breathtaking, both in its scenic beauty and in its physical demand. I reached the summit by early afternoon, feeling a sense of accomplishment as I took in the panoramic view. After a short rest, I began my descent, expecting it to be straightforward. But as I hiked down, an unsettling fog began to roll in, thick and disorienting. I checked my compass and map frequently, but something seemed off. The trail markers, once clear, now became sporadic and hard to follow. The landscape, so familiar on my ascent, felt strangely different. Hours passed and I should have been nearing the base, but the trail just kept going. The fog grew denser, and a chilling sense of isolation set in. I tried to retrace my steps, thinking I might have taken a wrong turn, but the path behind me was just as confusing. As night fell, I realized I was lost. The fog was so thick now that my flashlight barely cut through it. I decided to stop and set up a makeshift camp, hoping to wait out the fog until morning. But the strangest part came with the dawn. When the sun rose, the fog lifted, revealing not the familiar trails of Mount Baldy, but an unrecognizable, dense forest. I was on a completely different path, 
one I had no recollection of taking. My map was useless here. Panicked, I started walking, hoping to find my way out or run into another hiker. But the forest seemed endless, the trees a repeating pattern of eerie similarity. I walked for hours, but it felt like I wasn't making any progress at all. It was as if the forest was reshaping itself around me. Then I heard voices, distant and echoing. They seemed to be calling my name. I followed them, thinking that it might be other hikers or a search party looking for me, but the voices led me in circles, always out of reach, their whispers tinged with an unsettling familiarity. By the time I found my way out of the forest, it was night again. I emerged onto a trail that led me back to the base of Mount Baldy. How I got there, or where I had been, I still can't explain. I was found by a park ranger, who told me I had been missing for two days. They'd been searching for me, thinking that I had fallen or injured myself. The experience on Mount Baldy has left me bewildered and deeply unsettled. I've hiked those trails before and since, and nothing like that has ever happened again. I can't explain the shifting landscape, the endless forest, or the voices that seem to echo out of nowhere. The hike on Mount Baldy was more than just a physical journey. It was a brush with something I have no way of understanding. And whatever it was, it will be with me forever. The Melody of Crater Lake by Jordan L. My encounter during a camping trip near Crater Lake in Oregon still puzzles me. Crater Lake, known for its deep blue water and legends, seemed like the perfect spot for a solo camping adventure. I was looking for peace and quiet, but what I found was mystery. I set up camp in a secluded spot with a view of the lake. The first day was blissful. I hiked around the area, taking in the stunning scenery. As night fell, I sat by my campfire, the stars reflecting off the lake's surface, creating an almost otherworldly atmosphere. That's when I first heard it, a soft, haunting melody drifting across the lake. It sounded like a flute, but sweeter, more ethereal. I looked around, trying to find the source, but there was no one in sight. The music seemed to be coming from the lake itself. Intrigued and a bit unnerved, I decided to investigate. I walked along the shore, the melody growing louder, more compelling. It was as if the music was calling to me, pulling me toward a hidden secret of the lake. As I reached a clearing by the water's edge, the music suddenly stopped. The silence was abrupt, almost jarring. I stood there, confused, looking out over the calm waters. There was a ripple, as if something had just submerged, but other than that, nothing. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing with questions. I barely slept, the memory of the melody replaying in my mind. The next morning, I asked a park ranger about it. He smiled and said that others had reported hearing strange music around the lake, usually at night. Some believed it was the wind, others thought it was something more mystical, but nobody ever thought it was threatening, and neither did I. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the melody lingered. On my last night, I heard it again. This time, I just listened, letting the mysterious music wash over me. It almost felt like a farewell, a closing serenade from the depths of Crater Lake. My camping trip there was over, and sadly I had to leave. And as unsettling and sometimes mysterious as I find the whole thing, I'm also really looking forward to going back. Like I said, it didn't strike me as being threatening, just odd. And who couldn't use a little touch of whimsy from time to time?
Sleigh Bells Ring by J.R. Our eerie encounter in the Smoky Mountains started as a group camping trip aimed at exploring the natural beauty and rugged terrain of one of America's most beloved national parks. But what we experienced over those few nights has left each of us questioning the reality of the wilderness that surrounds us. Our group, five in total, set up camp in a secluded area, surrounded by dense forests and a clear view of the starry sky. The first day was an adventure, filled with hiking and sightseeing and everything we had gone there for. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, shared some stories, and were pretty much just enjoying the peaceful ambiance of the mountains. Then we started to hear a noise. We all kind of sat up and looked around, trying to figure out what it was. It was ringing, like the sound of small bells echoing throughout the forest. It was faint, but distinct, encircling our campsite. It was kind of close to Christmas, and so we kind of joked about it, making up stories of Santa or forest fairies or lost hikers with jingle bells. But as the ringing continued, a sense of unease settled over us. Eventually, we shrugged it off as a quirk of the forest. Maybe somebody had weird wind chimes on a cabin somewhere or maybe it was some kind of natural phenomenon. We figured we'd look it up when we got home and thought nothing of it. We went to bed and even though it was kind of strange, the sound of the bells did sort of lull us to sleep. The next morning, we found something that turned the whole ordeal from something whimsical to something downright scary. Right in the middle of our campsite, there lay a single sleigh bell, old and slightly rusted. None of us had seen it before, none of us owned anything like it, and none of us could explain how it got there. The sight of it, so out of place this deep in the wilderness, was deeply unsettling. Every single night of our trip, the scenario repeated. The distant ringing of bells, always starting at nightfall and continuing until dawn. Every morning, we would find another singular sleigh bell in the middle of camp. We searched the area, thinking maybe somebody was playing a prank on us, but we never found another sign of a human presence anywhere. Our conversations about the bells became more serious and speculative. We discussed everything from pranksters to supernatural explanations, but none of it made sense. The Smoky Mountains are rich with folklore and legends, but none that we knew of mentioned mysterious bells. On our last night, the ringing was louder, more insistent. It felt like whatever was making the noise was getting closer and more intentional. We barely slept, the sound of bells consuming our thoughts. In the morning, we found not one, but several sleigh bells scattered around our tents, one for each of us to be exact. We packed up and left the mountains with more questions than we dared to admit more questions than any of us really wanted answers to. We talked about reporting it, but what on earth would we say? We were stalked by Santa? It sounded absurd even to us. Hey, we'd like to report sleigh bells in the woods and random bells in our campsite. I mean, come on. Ever since that trip, we've all stayed in touch. Occasionally, we bring up the bells and our theories. Some of us have tried to research similar occurrences, but so far we've come up empty-handed. So here we are, asking if anybody else has experienced this in the Smoky Mountains.